Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to our weekly stakeout. This week, I am proud House Republicans are bringing my bill, the Rain in Inflation Act, to a vote on the House floor. The Rain in Inflation Act will deliver on House Republicans' commitment to America, holding Joe Biden accountable for his costly executive orders that fuel this historic Biden inflation crisis, a painful tax on every American. In Joe Biden's first year in office alone, he issued more executive orders than any president in my lifetime, costing taxpayers more than $1 trillion. From canceling the Keystone XL pipeline to pushing the out of touch and radical Green New Deal regulations, it's past time for Joe Biden to address the price tag of these costly executive orders. The Rain and Inflation Act will expose Joe Biden and demand transparency for the American people by revealing just how much Biden's executive actions are costing hardworking families. I'm proud to lead this legislation and to deliver results for upstate New York hardworking families and small businesses, as well as families and small businesses across America. House Republican Conference, we are also kicking off our commitment to America across America. You will note that our committees are hosting hearings outside of the Beltway, hearing firsthand from communities that are impacted by these harmful Democrat policies. Hearings in Yuma, Arizona, Petersburg, West Virginia, and Midland, Texas. House Democrats refuse to show up, listen, and lead across America. House Republicans will continue to show up, listen, and lead on behalf of the American people. To talk more about this work across America, I'm proud to turn it over to one of our rising star freshmen, which we feature every week at our House Republican Stakeout, Juan Siscamani. He's going to give an update to uh, the border delegation trip led by Speaker McCarthy to the Tucson sector. Juan. Thank you, Chairwoman, for the opportunity. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to briefly cover the visit by Speaker McCarthy and a delegation of freshmen that I was able to host in the Tucson sector just a little over a week ago in, in Arizona. This was an eye-opening uh, experience for, for especially the, the three freshmen that came with us. I was very proud to be able to host the Speaker uh, on his first trip to the border as Speaker of the House to be able to see what's happening in the Tucson sector, which includes several counties in my district, including Cochise County, where we spend the majority of our time that is part of the Tucson sector. This is an area of the border that is unlike any other area that uh, our, the people that were there had seen. And part of the reason is because this is, you're not seeing in this region the family units turning themselves in. This is where you're seeing the really bad actors uh, doing really bad things to both the community and also the, the drug crossing. This is a, also a region in Pima County where I live. This is the largest county in my district where fentanyl overdoses are now the leading cause of death among young people, uh, 19 and younger, surpassing car accidents for the first time in history. This is completely unacceptable. And to quote the Tucson sector chief, he said that what he had seen before was unprecedented. What he's seeing now, he doesn't have an adjective to describe it. That's exactly the problem that we're facing. And this administration with President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas have continued to ignore this issue while our caucus continues to visit and, and shines a light on this issue. Now the members that were with me, the freshman members, were from Wisconsin, Oregon, and Virginia. You may ask, why those states? I've been saying over and over again that with the fentanyl crisis, every state is now a border state. I talked to two different mothers this week, the, the week that I was at home, whose sons overdosed on fentanyl and are no longer with us. These are families that are being torn apart, and this is the human element that we have to keep in the forefront of our activities and our actions when it comes down to the border. This, this, this uh, group, my colleagues here, are all focused on securing the border and offering real solutions that will get to that. Now I'd like to turn it over to my good friend, Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin. Thank you. Tonight, the uh, Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party will be hosting its first hearing at 7 p.m. in the Cannon Caucus Room. Um, we have been charged by Speaker McCarthy with uh, injecting a sense of urgency into this strategic competition with the CCP. And though we call it a strategic competition, it is not a polite tennis match. This is an existential struggle over what type of world we want to live in. Do we want to live in an Orwellian world of total totalitarian techno control, a world that looks like Xinjiang light, or do we want to live in the free world where we are free from fear of repression, free to choose our own future? 
That is the stakes that we are trying to communicate tonight in our first hearing, as well as the fact that this isn't a distant threat. The, the threat posed by the CCP isn't an over there problem. It's a right here at home problem. And I'm not just talking about Chinese spy balloons drifting over our nuclear ICBM facilities. I'm talking about the dissidents that I held a rally with in the heart of Manhattan in front of an illegal CCP police station on Saturday that was being used to harass and surveil dissidents on American soil. I'm talking about the students I subsequently met with, Chinese students on American campuses that have been harassed and even physically assaulted by CCP sympathizers. So the time to act is now. The Chinese Communist Party is the greatest threat of our generation, and we need to start pushing back and acting with a sense of urgency, and that work begins tonight. With that, I will introduce the pride of Ohio, Ohio 6, Representative Bill Johnson. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, on February 3rd, a Norfolk Southern train carrying toxic chemicals derailed in the small Appalachian village of East Palestine, changing life as they know it for thousands. The bright spot in all of this is the work of the first responders, the local mayor, and other local officials, and the residents who are determined to get back to normal. But President Biden has been conspicuously silent. Now, my subcommittee, the Environment, Manufacturing, and Critical Materials Subcommittee on Energy and Commerce is going to hold a hearing on the response by the EPA uh, on March 28th, so I'm looking forward to that. But my message this morning is for President Biden. Mr. President, it's past time for you to make the short trip to East Palestine and show up for the 5,000 Americans who call that little small Appalachian village home. You pride yourself on your Lunch Bucket Joe nickname and tout your blue-collar Scranton, Pennsylvania roots. But, Mr. President, there is nowhere more blue-collar than Northeast Ohio, and no people more deserving of hearing directly from their president right now than the residents of East Palestine. They want comfort. They want to know you care and they want commitment. They want your assurance that the federal government will see this cleanup through long after the cameras go away. Mr. President, I urge you to show the residents of East Palestine the same respect, the same courtesy, the same love I'm sure you would have shown the residents of a New York or San Francisco had the derailment and chemical spill happened there. With that, I, uh, I'm proud to introduce our Majority Whip, Tom Emmer. Today, I want to take the opportunity to talk about an important piece of legislation that may or may not yet be on your radar. Last week, I introduced the uh, Central Bank Digital Currency Anti-Surveillance State Act to halt the efforts of unelected bureaucrats here in Washington, D.C. from stripping Americans of their right to financial privacy. Digital assets in the digital economy are the future, but the Federal Reserve should play no role in developing a central bank digital currency, or otherwise known as a CBDC. The consequences, if we get it wrong, are far too serious. The Biden administration is currently itching to create a digital authoritarian-styled surveillance-style digital dollar, uh, and through an executive order, they are pursuing analysis on a retail CBDC that would not be open, permissionless, permissionless uh, or private. In fact, it would be ridden with significant risk to Americans' privacy, security, financial inclusion, and a whole lot more. This kind of digital currency would give the federal government access to and control over literally every financial transaction conducted by Americans. That's why I, along with a number of my colleagues, introduced the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act. It's going to prohibit the Fed from issuing a CBDC directly to anyone. Uh, it's going to bar the Fed from using the CBDC to implement monetary policy and control our economy. And it's going to require the Fed's CBDC projects to be transparent if they get to go forward, to be transparent to Congress and the American people. We need these common-sense guardrails to prevent 
unelected bureaucrats here in Washington from sacrificing Americans' right to financial privacy. As I think Mike Gallagher's committee is going to show us tonight, uh, we do not want to emulate the CCP. We should not be taking our, uh, our uh, direction from the Communist Party of China. Developing a digital version of the U.S. dollar that makes transactions more efficient, extends financial inclusion, and does not compromise American sovereignty or privacy will send us into the next several generations of the digital economy, and we can't afford to get this wrong. And with that, uh, before I turn it over to uh, the Cajun, who is always more fun when he's raging, uh, I just want to point out, for those of you that I know have been waiting for this day for at least uh, uh, several months, tomorrow night is the congressional uh, hockey game. And if you want to see the greatest trophy in sport, uh, it will be the Stanley Cup will be in the Whip's office uh, from 9.30 to 12 today. And with that, Steve Scalise. Thank you for that time, I think. Um, <laughs> good morning. and. Uh, Good to see all of you. Uh, you know, when we ran for the majority, we made a commitment to America. We talked about a number of things that we would do. We've already gotten hard at work on those things. One of the things we committed is that we would bring Congress to the people. We'd actually have field hearings in communities across America to listen to real, real citizens, re listen to people in their communities talking about the challenges that people are facing so that we can do a better job up here of bringing legislation that responds to the problems that they're dealing with. Uh, as we all know, there is a crisis at our southern border. Uh, while the vice president, who is supposed to be the czar of the border, will not go down to the border, we've gone down multiple times. In just these last two weeks, we had a number of committees holding hearings at the border. You saw the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the Homeland Security Committee, all holding hearings. Uh, in fact, not only did they talk about the crisis at the border, uh, Captain McMorris Rogers in the Energy and Commerce Committee had a hearing specifically on the fentanyl crisis. You know, today, almost 300 young people will die from fentanyl overdoses. Yesterday, nearly 300 died. Tomorrow, nearly 300 young people will die every single day in America because Joe Biden opened the border. We've been highlighting this for a long time, and it angers a lot of people. We've heard from families at these hearings. I think it's disgraceful that a majority of Democrats refuse to even show up at these hearings. These are full committee hearings, Republican, Democrat, where citizens are coming. Law enforcement officers are coming in their communities talking about the problems that Washington can fix. President Biden could fix these problems today, and he refuses to. And so Congress is working through the legislative process to bring bills to the floor to confront these problems. And it starts with hearings, and especially these hearings, in communities across America. So we're gonna continue doing this to get that feedback uh, from people who are struggling because of the weight of the problems coming out of Washington so that we can have Washington better respond to those hardworking families. If Democrats wanna be a part of that, we've invited them and welcomed them to be a part. If they wanna sit on the sidelines and, and let these families struggle without even showing up for work, we're gonna show up for work and we're gonna bring those bills. This week we've got a few more of those bills, one of course dealing with ESG, which is hurting uh, a lot of investors, people who have 401ks, who have pension funds. Uh, but we're also bringing, as our conference chair talked about, Elise Stefanik's bill, the Rain and Inflation Act. Inflation is probably the biggest pro challenge facing hardworking taxpayers. They're paying more for everything. Double digit increases at the grocery store, double digit increases on their energy bills. And President Biden and all of his far left radical uh, rules and regulations that are coming out of these agencies are crushing hardworking families. And shouldn't they at least put the cost? When they roll out a new rule or regulation or executive order, shouldn't you at least see the cost to families so that maybe they think twice before imposing these costs on families? The average family is losing about $10,000 a year in higher costs because of all these radical rules coming out of Washington. It's about time we start reining that in. We're gonna be bringing a bill to the floor tomorrow to do just that and continue to follow through on our commitment to America to address those problems facing hardworking families. With that, be happy to take any questions, yeah. Well, if you know, the committee budgets are based on majority. So the majority has always gotten more money than the minority. We have more members on the committee. Uh, so ultimately, if you look at the budgets, it reflects what the majority and minority get. And they're going to 
do those field hearings out of their existing budget. Obviously, there's a cost to doing it, but I think the value we get as lawmakers is we actually get to hear from real people who can't always fly up to Washington, who can't take a day off of work, or a law enforcement officer who's out there on the job trying to protect the community uh, from an open border that's seen thousands of people come across, as Juan Siscomani talked about. Uh, it's good to go into those communities and actually see it firsthand, so there's a lot of value for us. Happy Mardi Gras, two lanes in my district, and uh, the Cotton Bowl champion, two lane Green Wave. You know, we can use the Cotton Bowl every day. <laughs> um, I do have a question uh, in two parts. First, to the Minnesota delegate, and first would be on the concerns of January 6th and the fact that we were talking about in today's meeting and yesterday with the State of the Department of Health. Is there concern, as much as there's a desire for transparency around this, around security implications of this releasing of the Board of Control? Well, of course, if you watch what the January 6th committee did under Speaker Pelosi, they actually released a lot of video that was very sensitive. I mean, they literally released video of, of Vice President Pence exiting the Capitol, showing the route that he takes. Uh, I didn't hear a lot of concern about that back then. We were concerned how selective they were, but ultimately Speaker McCarthy has talked about going through, and then what gets released is going to obviously be scrutinized to make sure that you're not uh, exposing any sensitive information that hasn't, by the way, already been exposed. S what Speaker Pelosi did was expose a lot of sensitive information, including the what was an undisclosed location where the leadership of both parties went after uh, her, her daughter was videoing uh, inside of that, that military base, which wasn't supposed to happen. I, well, they, they released a lot of stuff that probably wouldn't be good uh, for Capitol Police, but ultimately, you know, exposing, like I said, the vice president's full route, uh, leader at the time, McCarthy's full route uh, from his office to, to exiting the building. So I'm not sure if that was scrutinized, but clearly um, what Speaker McCarthy's talked about is he wants transparency, but obviously they're going to look to make sure that no additional things that have already not been released, uh, the, the sensitive information that Speaker Pelosi released. Oh, and did you have something for Gallagher? I, I did. I, I, I'm happy to answer. All right. Um, can you talk about the joint operating budget for the DOD? Can you state what it is and what you think it will be doing prior to having that? Yeah, and Speaker McCarthy has talked about that, is that it will be ultimately released uh, to all media, and, you know, that's a process that's ongoing right now. Uh, In the back. Well, well, I can tell you that, that the places they are shipping that soil are licensed, certified by the EPA, uh, disposal sites for both the soil and the water. So I'm, I'm leaving that to the EPA. I know Norfolk Southern has contracts uh, with various disposal sites around the country. Uh, they do that for a living. That's what they're there for. I mean, you know, these, these events are tragic. Uh, nobody wants them to happen in their communities, but when they do, we've got to have some place to dispose of the toxic waste. And so that is an ongoing thing. It's something that my subcommittee will be looking at, right? But as, as far as regulations on the whole, uh, look, I'm, I'm never in favor much of more federal government, the federal government telling the states how to do their business. Uh, but we've got to wait for the full investigative report from the National Transportation Safety Board, find out why this uh, accident occurred, uh, if there's anything that could have been tightened up that would have prevented it. But we just won't know that until we get all of the investigation uh, material and report uh, in hand. Is that March hearing going to be in Columbiana County? No, we're, we're going to have a field hearing in uh, East Palestine at some point. Right now, the residents of that community want the workers to get that place cleaned up. The last thing they want is a circus of politicians coming there uh, to get what they determine to be a, uh, a photo op. We're not there. We don't want to go there for a photo op. I've been there on the ground nearly nonstop. I was there uh, virtually every day during the, uh, the two-week district work period. I will be back again when I, uh, when I go back to Ohio. But, uh, but we'll do a field hearing there at the right time 
when the residents are ready for it. But here's what I told the residents, and this is important. Both the EPA, federal and state, Norfolk Southern, everybody, the governors of both Pennsylvania and Ohio, have told the residents of East Palestine that they're going to be there for the long haul. Norfolk Southern has said, we're going to be with you for the long haul. We're going to make this right. My word to the people of East, uh, of East Palestine is, you get to determine where the finish line is. It's not over until you say it's over. This happened to you, not because of you, and you're the ones that get to decide when your questions have been answered, when your fears have been alleviated, when you feel safe again to bring your families and live in your homes.